So let's get started. So I'm excited to introduce our first kickoff entrepreneur, Tim Neer of Cyborg Lab. Good morning. So this is particularly special for me because I'm an alumni of NHTI. And, uh, and uh, Concord was founded here in Concord in 2017. So we were originally making uh, bioassisting wearables, these devices that we thought would um, enhance the performance of the body. We, we were building them to be a new version of consumer product. And more recently, we've pivoted to focus on our software. Um, so you may see some pieces about us either uh, here in the newsletter. We are still looking to do those items in the future, but we focus on our software to get to market faster, and we've been able to do that in the last few months. So we can discuss that more in the Q&A. So I am the CEO and founder of Cyborg, and we are reimagining activity by developing the next generation of mobile fitness platform. So through market research, we identified that there are a few problems with the current apps in the market. Maybe you've used uh, Map My Run or a Run Keeper for your walks, hikes. Um, one of them was they didn't provide enough gamification. So that when, when people were out uh, on a run by themselves, maybe say a 10 mile run, they sort of felt isolated, right? There was no connection to other people who were doing similar activities in real time. Oh. And, uh, and the other problem that we identified was that voice-based assistants, so Google Assistant, Siri, and Alexa, none of them know anything about fitness. In fact, if you ask Siri to help you get fit, Siri just finds places in your area with the title of fit. So there is, there's almost no assistance from the major tech giants. So uh, we, we rushed to MVP, and that's you know, a term acronym for Minimum Viable Product. And we put out our minimum viable product and launched that in August of this year. Um, and we put out a press release with it, basically saying that a small, scrappy startup from New Hampshire had beaten the tech giants to market for voice-activated fitness applications. And uh, our press release went a little viral. It was shared by over 100 media outlets all over the world. And um, you know, now instead of having to interface with the graphical you know, portion of your device, you can simply say, OK, Sai, and inquire about a variety of information pertaining to your workout. We specifically targeted this towards running, but it can be used for all different kinds of, of activity. This is where we're taking it now, is um, if, you, if you imagine a virtual running competition, the, the, the biggest problem with that is that conventional metrics like distance and time, they don't translate well virtually because the problem is the terrain is different for every single person. So if you had a digital race to 3.1 miles, um, it's everybody could find the biggest downhill slope that they could possibly have in their town and just run down it to increase their performance, right? And so what we knew we had to do was really capture the environment of, of the participant. And so we've created terrain scanning algorithms, which look at a myriad of data from elevation um, and barometric pressure. And from there, what we actually do is we run it through an algorithm and we determine what's called a Borg score. So what that allows for is rather than running to a target distance, for example, like you would for a road race, participants would run to a target board score. And that would allow somebody from Dubai, Denver, and you know, Death Valley to all compete at the very same time and get the respective credit for the terrain that they're traversing. And so we're going to be using this technology to hold the first virtual road race in 2009. The second thing we're doing is we're making our SI assistant a lot more intelligent. So. Um, if you have a, a natural language inquiry like, I want to lose 10 pounds for my wedding, right? That's a very difficult thing for, uh, for, for a computer to understand. Understanding natural language the way I'm speaking to you now is, is you know, one level of difficulty, but understanding intent, the root meaning behind what you're trying to say, that's yet another, another level of uh, intelligence. So I'll show you on the next slide the machine learning model that we're using in order to decode that. But Sai is going to be able to look at a myriad of information from weather to your schedule and help you get uh, your workouts tailored for the, the time that you have and also map your route for you and do a lot of other um, you know, assistance for you. So this is our machine learning overview. And I didn't, I didn't put this up here for you to understand it more so just to gawk at it and say, wow, that looks complicated. So um, this, this, uh, this is the way that Sai takes natural language and intent and using a word to vec format uses algorithms to map your requests in an abstract mathematical space. All that is to say that when you say something to Sai like you would to a personal trainer, Sai will understand that inquiry, not just from a, you know, from a basic level, but from a contextual level. 
and um, we'll be launching our Psi AI training plans in May of 2019. When we launched in August, we were met with great praise from the community. We were ranked top five on Product Hunt that day. I'm not sure if you know about Product Hunt, but it's a worldwide community of entrepreneurs launching new products. And um, you know, we were just overwhelmed by the response that we got on Product Hunt. Since then, we've earned a 4.9 out of 5 rating on the App Store. And in the last 30 days, 16.5% of users have upgraded. That's, that peaked last week at 22.7%, and that's over four times the industry average for freemium upgrade rates. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> this is an extremely crowded space, right? Everybody has fitness apps on their phone. There are a lot of people, a lot of people doing this. And one of the ways that we found um, that we're, we're going to be able to get to market is by leveraging these pre-existing communities. So you may have heard of Tough Mudder or the Spartan Race before. These companies organize physical events all over the world. And uh, the major challenge that they have is keeping their audience engaged. Face, they've had a really aggressive Facebook marketing campaign. Have you seen the V personal trainer? Um, it's, it's a set of headphones that use AI and technology by Bauer and Wilkins to be able to assist you, be able to assist you on your run. The problem that both of our competitors have here, both Active and Lightbeam, is they're actually doing uh, recordings of, of people in a recording studio having to conjure up these phrases that they then place with AI at the appropriate times for, for participants. Um, the problem with that is that you're very limited in scope to what you can say to the user because every single new phrase you want to tell them, you have to go into a recording studio and record. But because our uh, Asai engine uses speech synthesis, what that does is it allows us to put in any written text and, and instantly say it to the user using um, a voice-based synthesis that uses AI. So it sounds natural. It has inflection and pauses. Um, and that's why we believe we're going to be able to keep our costs a lot lower as our competition as we scale to cover more activities. A little bit about myself. I was previously the lead engineer of a data acquisition systems company and technology manager for the telematics division at John Deere. John Deere. Um, my lead software engineer went to Dartmouth and he has a master's in computer science and emphasis in machine learning and advanced algorithms. And Phil Wu recently uh, joined us, Master's of Computer Science from the University of New Haven, and a background in social iOS apps. We're also very fortunate to have a great group of advisors, all with backgrounds uh, pertaining to our growth. That's it. Look forward to uh, getting in touch, and I would ask that you please download the Cyborg app, and I'd love to hear from you. So what's your biggest challenge right now? <laughs> um, I would say that it's a very complicated project and um, a lot, you know, along with a lot of other entrepreneurs, finding that early traction is, is sort of the critical point. So how much, how much value earned through the traction without taking so long in development that you, let's say, bleed out the investment money that you have, right? That's a very, very difficult balance. To stay lean, to stay scrappy, um, be a small team, but still compete with these much larger organizations because people have a lot of options on the marketplace. So um, what we've done is we've really started small. Uh, I, I went through the entire Alpha Loft curriculum. I'm not sure if you know about Alpha Loft, but it's a nonprofit in New Hampshire that supports early stage companies. So um, Alpha Loft is uh, a fantastic organization, and we've been through all of their programs. So we went through their startup incubator. Um, and then their startup accelerator. We participated in startup shindig, and now through the New Hampshire Tech Alliance, we'll be participating in Tech Out on November 15th. And one of the things that they taught us was um, simple, compelling. You know, those two words they ring in my head almost every single day. Make it simple. Make people want to pay for it. And and that's what we've done with our voice-based assistants. We found the one thing that nobody else in the market has, and we've really tried to engineer it to be pretty slick. What type of data do you have to enter in order for it to accurately give you feedback? Your age, weight, height? We're pulling data and information from HealthKit, um, but theoretically, it's nothing. So the idea of the machine learning engine is that we'll send you on a run. Uh, let's say, let's take your first one mile run. And from that, we're going to look at biometric information. We understand the environment that you traversed, and we're going to combine those two things with information like your gender and your age to understand your level of fitness. 
and through Psy's fitness identification system, then we're going to take that image, that snapshot of how fit you are, and use that to scale your plan with context of what your goal was. For example, lose weight, get stronger, run a marathon. And, and those three things, imagine it like a Venn diagram, where the center is all of that information coming together to help the user achieve their goal. So it's not just self-selected? In what context? I'm sorry. Like, I couldn't say that I was this fitness level and maybe misinterpret what my own fitness Right, and that's where we find a lot of the confusion and sometimes frustration is. You, you know, uh, I'll touch on that one more second, but I think it's important to note that the Borg score, that that measurement that we have, it's it's not um, dependent upon any metric or status of the individual. So, like mileage, if I'm a 55 year old female or a 20 year old male. 26.2 miles is 26.2 miles, right? And so we wanted to keep the integrity of the board score by not allowing user enterable data because we knew it would easily be manipulated. So um, the board score ha has no difference uh, to, to those enterable figures. And furthermore, we didn't want the training plans to be skewed by those who may be a little bit too optimistic about where their fitness level is. And I think the problem is that people try and climb the ladder at too, rate, uh, too you know, steep of a rate and that's when frustration occurs, and what you need in fitness, when, especially when you're starting out, are the little wins. You know, you just gotta, you just gotta have, feel like you're hitting your goal every single day, and that's what incentivizes you to come back. Any other questions? You mentioned one of your competitors is using social media as their main acquisition strategy, so I was curious, what are you doing for onboarding new customers, and what's the cost for acquiring a new customer versus a lifetime value? Yeah, that's great. Um, so a couple things that we're doing, it's, it's pretty timely that you ask because this is a new initiative just this week. Uh, we recently made a 10 second Facebook ad which um, ex explains our value proposition. It's a woman running down a trail, she asks Sai, you know, okay Sai, what's my 5k pace? Sai reports the 5k pace, she's running the entire time, never touches her phone. Um, and that's something we just started. The viewership rate of that, people watching all the way to the end of that 10 second ad is, is over 85% which is a stat that we're really proud of because typically uh, an industry standard on that is somewhere in the vicinity of 20 to 25% people will watch the video all the way to the end. We don't have the data yet on how that's converting into downloads, um, but we are using both app store optimization, which is kind of like SEO that you use in Google, but specifically for people finding things on the app store, and uh, search ads from, from Apple. And recently, using a new retargeting method, uh, we brought our customer acquisition cost from around $6 to around $3. Um, and you know the lifetime value is still a little early for that because we only have a few months of data. But we are releasing later this week the ability for somebody to buy a year of Cyborg Go Plus um, at a 40% discount, so we can get more of that lifetime value up front, help us uh, scale quickly. Yeah. So how I was going to ask. So how does that work? Is it a continuity type model where it's a monthly fee, or there's just one a single cost to download the app or both? Yeah. So. We're setting it up as a monthly recurring, and okay. we're doing that to keep the, the barrier of entry lower for the consumer. Okay. So right now, you can either get a free seven-day trial at $3.99 a month after that free seven-day trial, or, um, or you know, later this week, we're gonna be providing the, the one-year option okay. at $29.99 is where we sell. Okay. So that's a 38% discount. Um, if you look at, once we get side to the next generation of training plan, uh, we're, we're going to keep the price the same because our, our costs don't scale right. through the effort. It's just development time. Um, but once we get through that, we, we believe that Sai is going to be able to offer people a per personal training experience at their homes. And you, you know, might not need a gym membership. You might just be able to do work outside. That's sort of cool. Yeah. So I just ran a, a half this weekend, and I would have liked to have test driven this half before coming in here. What's the Android version? The Android version is coming. Um, this was a this was a strategic move in order to build iOS first and make all our mistakes on one platform. Um, <laughs> being that we are a small team, if we had to go fix it in two different places, two very different styles of coding, it really would have put a parachute behind us as we're trying to run and, and get this thing off the ground. Um, so iOS typically, because of the integration with the Apple Watch, because of HealthKit, things are a little bit smoother on that side of things. It's a little bit, the objective is more isolated. So as soon as we get to the point where we're you know, generating enough revenue to not be burning cash or receive the next round of investment, we're gonna immediately be in building out the Android side. But we need to expand our team by about three to four more people. 
Any thoughts to eventually integrate this with other wearables like heart monitors or something to take your pulse? As an older runner, I find I'm sometimes a little real unrealistic about my pace. Sure. And I like for me, I'd love it if this thing said to me, um, "Pick it up. My grandmother can run fast." <laughs> or maybe hey, you should maybe back off a little. You've got another four miles to go. Yeah. People, a ton of people have asked for the full metal jacket, sort of like drill sergeant person that could be in your ear. So that may be coming in the future. Um, one of the things we're working on right now is heart rate coaching. So Sai will be able, you'll be able to set before your workout, say, we can even provide a recommendation for your, for your heart rate. Say, we think you should be 135 to 155 based on your goals. And you'll set that up before you go out. And Sai will be in your ear and let you know, hey, you know, your heart rate is 143. Your right rate should be great job. Um, and that's going to be coming uh, a little later, probably early, early winter is when that's almost done. So we're planning a uh, little let's sneak peek. We're planning on releasing our first iteration of Watch app, Apple Watch app, um, on November 15th is our little app tech app. So, and we'll have full heart rate information. Is this just for walkers and runners, or do you have any plans for cyclists or anything beyond? Yeah, uh, hiking, currently supporting hiking. And we are going to support cyclists. Um, there are a few considerations there. Cyclists do a lot more distance than, than obviously than runners, and uh, we might have to scale the Borg score in a different way for cyclists, or just create a new way of displaying it because their scores are going to be really high. And so we're working through some of the logistics for that right now. But ideally, in in the end, you'd be able to use this for almost anything, including indoor workouts, which is something that we're getting going for this winter. And that's part of the reason why we're bringing our heart rate coaching online now so that you'd be able to use the heart rate coach on the treadmill and, and stay right in that fat burn zone, for example, if that's what you were looking for. Yeah? Just thinking of cycling, uh, thinking about the Swift model, and I wonder if you had a chance to check out what they do in cycling as far as the competition goes. You mentioned the future, you're going to do a race. Mm -hmm. I wonder if there's things to learn from Swift sort of looking at how they do it, uh, if you had a chance to check that out. Yeah, a friend of mine has Swift, and he loves it. He uses it a lot. I think there are definitely some lessons to be learned there. One place that I think uh, Swift could use improvement is in the gamification side of things. Feeling more light and approachable for the layperson. Uh, I think that's one place that Strava in particular suffers, suffers is that people are intimidated by that platform and in order to get the 90% of the masses to feel welcome, it, can, it has to be a little bit more of a, a red carpet laid out to them and feel a little bit more from uh, a demographics perspective, uh, who is downloading the app and running through the free trial, and then who is finding or, or actually making the purchase? Yeah, uh, from what we've seen, it's been uh, people from 25 to 34 predominantly. I think that's around 70% of those folks. Uh, I want to say it's 60% comprised of 60% males and 40% females. So far, that's our data. Uh, and that is. As a flows through, with sort of the same demographic that tries, and then the same dem demographic that makes the purchase, or is there a difference in that population mm -hmm. where there's a bunch of people downloading, but this particular pocket or uh, group is actually paying? You know, it's a really good question. It's one of the it's one of the projects I'd like to take on with our analytics. The way that the analytics works, you don't get that sort of uh, finite detail from Apple. Mm -hmm. um, you have to build analytics triggers through a console that we use called Firebase. So Firebase is is a is a product by Google, and that's also what stores all the information from our users. And um, we have to build out each one of those triggers to understand the identity of the individual that walks down these roads to find out, let's say, if our product page converts better for women than it does for men because there is a photo of a woman and, and the women can uh, envision themselves using that product. So something that I'm, you know, I'm definitely interested in, I just don't have the answer to say. I was wondering, since this is a fitness app, are there any plans to create a sense of accountability between like fitness partners? Mm -hmm. For example, my my stepmom loves to read our planning. We both love walking. I mean, she'll walk eight miles at a time. So the idea is, what if we both had the app on our phones and we could somehow hold each other accountable? Like, oh, did you learn to walk today? Or, yeah. oh, I saw you walk four miles. Great job. Yeah, so, so uh, right now we have the leaderboard, the Borg score leaderboard. We started off with this, it's a localized leaderboard. So you could be, 
you go for your best run of the month, for example, let's say I get a 10,000 board score, and that's gonna rank me in Concord, and I'm maybe number three in the city of Concord. That's where we started. Where we see that going is that they're gonna be leaderboards for all kinds of different things. So you'll have localized leaderboards for the most calories burned in a day, um, the most steps taken in a week. And so you could say, you know, I walked the farthest of anybody in Concord, and, and you could share that with your friends on Facebook. Um, I, the next step of that, even further, is allowing to what uh, some challenges so that you and your office friends could say, uh, you know, I work in the dental hygiene office. We have another dental hygiene office that's that's across town. We want to take them on and do who can do the most steps of the entire office in a month. So you'd be able to add people to that group, or you'd be able to do an individual challenge like yourself and your stepmother. Is that right? Yeah. Um, so those are some of the paths in incentivizing competition in a way that's playful that we're looking to, to lock down for sure. And then maybe to that end, that works for the other question, but to that end, um, um, maybe a more holistic view, also not only a competitive model, but a supportive model. Um, you know, maybe there's a, a virtual coach or, or you know, hey, do this, get up, get out there. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's exactly what we're hoping to do with Sai. You can't see it, but this screen doesn't quite allow for it. But um, there's this text message push notification of Sai saying, hey, it's Sai. It's going to be 68 degrees and sunny at 6 p.m. I planned a 30-minute cardio workout for you. You've got this. So the okay. idea is by the time you get home, Sai, Sai knows your home, triggers it, says, hey, I see this is where you like to work out. I've got your workout all planned. The route's all good. Why don't you want to start now? That's cool. And then you'll be able to just go through that workout right out. Yeah. Um. Tim, it's great to have you back on campus. I, I appreciate it, and it's, it's wonderful that um, One Million Hubs is, is uh, partnering with the college to bring entrepreneurs onto campus. Um, with the interim president in the room and two advisory board members, um, can you give us any uh, advice on how we could better equip our students uh, to go out into the field of uh, entrepreneurship? Are there things that we did really well when you were on campus here, or things that we could do, um, giving us that feedback for our future students. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the, one of the things that I feel like I learned at NHTI was that I, if I had an ambition, right, I could see it through. And that was, I think, uh, maybe one of the biggest changes in myself is that the things that are built all around us that we use every single day, they're not built by other fictitious people, right? They're built by people like us who have this uh, enormous amount of drive and, and don't know where to place it, and they find that, that opportunity. For me, it was in engineering. So I'm a mechanical engineering student. I probably have no business being in software, and I wasn't a good student in, in high school, and I guess my, my point being, there are no reasons why I should have succeeded. There, should, there are no reasons why I should be succeeding, but through grit, through wonderful people who support you, through an ecosystem that develops entrepreneurs, um, you know, I, I, I think that anybody can do what I'm doing. And that's, that's really the message that I want to send, is that I think that uh, one of empowerment and one of encouragement and, and letting the students know there are both opportunities, but that they're, you know, they're being listened to and that they can do this. And, and that's, that's really the, you know, the message I would be spreading. So we have to move on to yeah. our next presenter. But in One Million Cups fashion, we always end with one question for the entrepreneur. So if you could take one minute, and part of, it's a good transition from what you just asked, and what Tim just said is, what can people here do to support you as an entrepreneur and to help you be successful? Are there resources, are there, are there things we can do to build our entrepreneurial community and help you be successful as a community here? The two things that we need in order to be successful are growth and feedback, and, and those both feed each other. So if you know people who run, or you yourself go for walks or run, please use the app. I'm gonna leave cards here up on the table. Let me know what it is you need. If you want a competition for you and your stepmother to be able to go and, and, and do walks, we're gonna build it. We are a company of the people. We want to build a product that you love, and we can only do that by understanding the challenges that you have in maintaining your fitness and us helping to remedy them. So please be communicative with us. Let us know what it is that you need or want, and we're here to serve you. And by serving you well, this demographic will serve the world well, and that's, that's where we'll be able to do it. So Tim, maybe you can stay to the end if people have more questions after we break? Absolutely. Great. Be happy to. So thank, thank you. you so much to Tim. <laughs>